Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're joined by William Sloan. He's a CMRP, CMRT, and MLE. He's a consultant at Iriducio with a heavy focus on MRO, storeroom improvements, root cause analysis, asset management, and more with an extensive background in all things maintenance and reliability. The list is extensive. You can go look him up on LinkedIn to learn more. He has a passion for training, teaching, and coaching others. Welcome, William, to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Greg, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. I, I really am glad we got a chance to connect and record this. We've spoken before. We recently talked about CMMS and how it fits into maintenance and reliability best practices. So what I'm wondering is what you see as a root cause for CMMS failures when it comes to failed deployments and failed adoption. I think the biggest thing, Greg, is not exactly getting from the client what they're really looking for. I think a lot of times we have somebody, you know, in the higher ups that, choose what they think is best for that facility without really giving a deep dive into that facility and understanding what exactly they're needing at the boots on the ground level, like we've talked about. You know, what are all the aspects that you want as part of that CMMS system to make it function the best for that particular plant? And, you know, to me, some of the uh, failure to adoption is you got to have a sponsor, number one. You got to have somebody leading that change. You know, people don't like change. And if you're rolling out something new or you're rolling out a different CMMS system to somebody, you know, you've got to have somebody there that can explain the features and benefits and the need for change and why we need to change, you know, go to a better product. You know, also when we have, uh, we're looking at subject matter experts, we don't do a deep dive in exactly how that CMMS system operates. We just look at that top level just to try to get somebody to learn how to create a work order, learn how to close a work order. And that's about all that we ever get them to do without seeing all the other features and benefits that that CMMS system might have for that organization. And I think those two reasons right there, a lot of times why, you know, that thing never gets off the ground or never as good as it really could have been as somebody pitched it to them in the beginning, you know? Yeah. And that's where I like that you brought that thing up and the the subject matter experts. So previously you and I talked about the deeper layer of the CMMS and making sure there's an internal subject matter expert at the client side that can really understand these things and then bridge that gap. And then we also would like to see, and I'm not calling out the vendors to be harsh. I'm calling out some things that they could do to also kind of improve that process when they're working with whatever that subject matter expert is at their client site, they themselves should be really absorbing what their process is, understanding what's really happening for the boots on the ground at that particular facility, manufacturing plant. Maybe it's, heavy equipment external that's on, you know, land subdivisions and all these kinds of things, because vendors get that opportunity with their exposure to persons like yourself, the clients themselves, and they start to kind of adopt those same perspectives and they get better. So you get those subject matter experts that are at the client site involved in the deployment, even the selection, well before they make the selection, they got to understand their process. And then the subject matter expert at said vendor, if they understand what it's like, you know, like in the real world doing this work and start to learn that, then there's a really nice collaboration and they can move to a train the trainer approach and really make their clients experts at whatever that solution is. I don't care which CMMS you use, but understand your process, then find the system that meets that process and then stay on it. Don't just do work orders start looking at the next level. Do you think the reason people kind of, I'm going to say drop the ball, but I want to be a little bit gentle about that in that they're so busy with what they're already doing. The people that were forced to use the system that someone from the top selected, they're like, all right, I can do a work order. And then they just get back to doing what they do already. Absent the system, they just want to get their work done. Yeah. That's right. And you, and you, you know, people tend to forget too, Greg, you know, a lot of times when we do the CMMS imp- improvements or implementations, 
you know, that contract a lot of times just has a certain amount of weeks that we're going to do training, you know, after the deployment. So they're trying to get all those people through that training, you know, to slam them in there, get them in a classroom, take it through the high level steps, give them a PowerPoint presentation, say, here you go, because, you know, they've only got a limited amount of time that they'll be on site or support, you know, before they leave and just turn it over to somebody else in that facility that's now tasked to, you know, train others. When at the very beginning, we may have not got everybody in there appropriately trained on how that system works, you know. It's a big challenge because for the for the vendors that are providing CMMS platforms and even the consultants involved that might help a client and a vendor come together and do this, they all have time limitations because it's really expensive. I've always been a proponent of vendors providing CMMS platforms, having at least some kind of sunk cost as it relates to driving the outcomes for their clients. And I think it's really hard for vendors to do that because it's a choice between staying focused on their own, I'm going to call them vanity metrics and the pursuit of top line revenue and things like that. And they get stuck on that, the higher up you go into that company. Right. And you get, you got to kind of bring that back. So I like when vendors try to figure that out or when they make that part of their DNA so that there aren't so many limits on the training. And if you're going to limit it, what what I used to do back in my CMMS days was set it up in a way where there was a frequency or a cadence, if you will, to ongoing training. And I liked having that built in. Mm -hmm. I know it has a cost, but I, I treated it partially as a sunk cost, you know, with my partners, the way we looked at it. And it made a big difference. So when we talk about, you and I talked about this, but I want to talk about it now, why we must get deep on the CMMS training, regardless of whether it's limited to three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, or if it's ongoing, why must we get deep on CMMS training? Well, Rick, you know, for the money that a company or organization spends, we got to get the most out of it. We got to get in there and see what exactly all will that, you know, system do that we designed it to do. You know, if it's, you know, adding assets to it, if it's adding bill of materials to that asset, if it's adding failure codes to those assets to understand why they failed so that we can get failure history from it, that we can figure out the ways that it failed, you know, and get that data. If we got to go look back in the history of it, that's why we got to have that extra training. That's why we got to have that deep dive. You know, it's a lot more than just closing a work order, opening a work order and just putting some social comments, but just taking that extra time to put detailed comments, detailed fields, you know, of what exactly happened to that asset, you know, it just makes it better for the next person. And it also gives us a history of the asset. You know, your company may be looking at replacing that asset, you know, doing a life cycle cost. And if those things are appropriately in that CMMS about the spare parts, about the failure codes and everything, it'll really help you make a better decision when it's time to retire that asset, you know. So it's very important that we do a deep dive in these because these CMMS systems are not utilized like, you know, everybody's designed them to do that. A lot of people just don't take advantage of that, you know? So. Yeah. And again, it's something we, we tend to get stuck on talk about quite often because there's so much resistance, I think on the imp, not just the implementation, but when you get to the adoption stage, like you said, early on, we learn how to do work orders. We're putting them in. We're getting some good stuff. Maybe you didn't have a system and now you're doing some some good data collection, but you got to go a little bit deeper so that that data is super meaningful on your decision-making process. And for me, what I always wanted to do with my clients is if I noticed I got a report from the support team or something like that, we do this periodic monitoring so that we could see the use activity. We weren't in looking at accounts. We were just looking at transactional stuff in the back end of the system and we'd see that somebody's not using asset management. So we'd reach out to them and we would say, uh, we noticed that you're doing a lot of work orders and some of those work orders might even reference assets, but you're not utilizing asset management. Is there anything over there that we can do? Can you tell us a little bit more about why that's happening? And they say, well, we're just having a problem with the data collection. People have to go around and collect all that data. So we would design systems for them to use the current behavior to slowly improve the behavior towards Tell you what, collect asset data on 40 or 50 assets over the next two weeks. If it takes you a month, so what? But do it. And then we'd say, now you've got work orders you can dedicate to that piece of equipment. Then we want to get you into PMs and all that kind of stuff. So I think the, the thing is we have to just keep harping on this. And the thing I'd want to say about it is, you know, somebody could reach out to an individual like you or your company 
and say, hey, we've got a CMMS. We like it, but we don't utilize it properly because we got a lot of resistance with the complexity at the boots on the ground level where they can't do it mobily because they don't know how. And you could come in and say, let's see what you got. Let's see what you're doing. What are your goals and outcomes? We can improve that. Even if it's a CMMS you've never used, you're going to see and understand hierarchically how that works or what the workflow really is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Absolutely. You know, and if they've got the capability, you know, with just even Excel, Excel forms, you know, if you've worked with those spreadsheets, you can take that stuff and upload that into those CMMS systems. And it doesn't take that long. You know, the, the painful task is getting all that data, you know, all those asset IDs and stuff like that. But they should have already had that stuff way before the CMMS systems coming in there, you know, unless it's a new organization and it's new equipment and things like that. But, Greg, you know, we miss it every single day, even when somebody's putting in a new piece of equipment the opportunity they have in that CMMS system to add everything to that piece of equipment because you're right there doing it anyway, right? And we miss that yeah. all the time. And it's so frustrating when you're trying to help folks. It's just, why didn't you do that when you're adding the other stuff in there, you know? And it just it just blows my mind sometimes. Um, and then you, they, you know, they come in there and, and ask for our help after that, you know? So. Yeah, and then you got to go backtrack and do the same exact thing. And that actually makes it take a bit longer, if not a lot longer, do you, do you think the resistance is at the, is the resistance to actually do that when they're commissioning a new asset or pulling an asset out, putting a new one in the, the five minutes it would take for them to do that. It's actually just too hard to, to go through that. Maybe there's not a mobile app. You can't do it on a tablet. They're trying to remember it, go back to a workstation and all that. Do you think it's really because the platforms themselves don't make it easy enough for boots on the ground because they they don't want to spend 22 minutes doing something if they can get it done in four or five minutes right yeah i don't think it's the asset i don't think it's the cmms greg i think it's just the i got to go find the drawing i got to go find the schematic i got to go find the manual get all that information put together you know sit down in front of a computer and put some ends not that not that hard um for most systems it's just getting the preparation piece of it ready to put that stuff in there and, you know, rather than doing it one at a time, we want to wait till we do it all together. And the task is just that much more bigger than breaking it up into bite-sized chunks, you know. But uh, if you had all that stuff, you know, when you're putting a new piece of equipment in, you should already have the drawings, the schematics, the bill of materials, you know, the recommended spare parts. It's all right there for you when you're at, when you're getting ready in your CMS system to enter that stuff in there. All that information's right there, you know, for you to put in. Why it doesn't get done, I don't know, you know, because... Some engineers will handle the spare parts. The storeroom may handle the spare parts. The technician's just working on the machine itself. He's not having anything to do with that setup. The planner may be the one putting it, you know, because you got three or four different people that may be doing. So it could be, too, we don't have defined roles and responsibilities of who should be doing what when they're putting his stuff in the CMMS as well, you know. So More and more, William, it sounds like people really need to either have the right internal resource or the right consultant or both involved in this to kind of move that, that kind of behavioral process and the organization process when it comes to who does what and does it all align. That's I, I think sure. that's really interesting. We're, we're for anybody that listens or watches this, that listens to or watches this, I, I think we're going to find these challenges everywhere. There's not necessarily a perfect recipe for solving it at least solving it quickly, you're going to have to go through the pain or the struggle of slightly changing that. Your existing work processes are probably really good and the system may or may not meet those work pro processes, but it's the behavioral change to really adopt the system. And I think people need to understand why are we doing this? And you know, Greg, they, that's they a great point. In. That's a great point because if you talk to a lot of people and you're yourself or very familiar with similar systems, when you ask somebody, hey, we're fixing to implement X, Y, Z, you know, they very rarely talk about the CMMS system itself. They talk about the painful process of implementation, how long it's going to take, the problems they had when they went through it, what training they didn't get. They very rarely talk about the function of that system they just got. They always remember how painful it was to change over and go to the new system. Oh, well, the old one, it doesn't capture my old data now. I've got to go look in this database to pull it back over in here, you know, and I think that's part of it too, with that resistance to change is that they start talking to somebody else that's gone through a similar process 
And I said, oh, my gosh, this is going to be terrible. So they've already set that mindset up in a negative way because all they hear are the horror stories, not the benefits of the new system. And so I think it's already put, you know, that CMMS uh, company behind the eight ball based on what other people have told them, you know, are, are the horror stories that's about to happen going through this implementation process. Well, you know, in effect, a lot of times, Greg, I've seen a lot of these organizations test this stuff for a very, very long time before they just roll something out. You know, they try to work through and get the bugs out and they try to do test systems and they try to do that to help the organizations. I very rarely have seen them just slam something in on somebody without a lot of testing at, you know, customer sites. And, you know, you've got someone that may be that one test location plant to do it. So, I mean, I, I, sometimes I don't think there's a fair rap there to the CMMS organization that's trying to implement something because they've already been set up in a not so nice way based on everybody else's horror stories, you know, or opinions, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's it. It, it's so true. And the reality of that is that if we encounter enough resistance and pain or perceived pain that we're going, we're about to, you know, kind of em, em, embark on this journey, that's going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. If you're not excited about that, because you're, you, you have this end in mind, so to speak, you know, uh, I, I had John Ross on CMMS radio and, uh, he was mentioning that it, it's critically important that you have an end in mind before you even start these things. Right. And vendors out there, the CMMS vendors. So that now this is me just giving my opinion on this overall thing is I think the vendors are really trying to do a great job, but they have their own limitations. They have their own say view of how their platform works. And then if something goes awry, now everybody's trying to scramble to do something they're, they're just not good at yet. It takes time. It does, Greg. And, and, you know, those you, if you go to an SMRP conference or a reliable plan or anywhere, you know, there's 25 different CMMS organizations there. They have their own little niche that they're trying to sell. And you're right. They may have never worked with your system, your operating system before or your platform. And so they're all trying to do the right thing. They're not trying to do a bad job, you know, because there's right. there's so much competition in that space. And you've got to you've got to find your niche and be very good at it because it's not easy because those those conferences are filled with with people trying to sell you their platform. And I'm thankful I'm not in that space anymore to have to try to select one. But, you know, that can be very difficult sometimes, you know. It's challenging. And, and think about what you just said. Very, very, very important. I think you have so much experience. You've seen so much regardless of the platforms or the places where they're being used that that's the the critical cha challenge is that when you go from your niche and into something that's slightly different, it really does create this, this, this lack of understanding of those environments. So we got to be fair to everyone, people using CMMS. Yeah. You need to change the way you're doing it. We're not beating you up here. We're saying, don't give up. Think about it. Take some of this information and figure it out uh, for the vendors out there. We know you're all trying to do a good job. And we want you to be better as well, but we, we understand there's going to be pain there as well. You got to take that time and do better. But I think everybody can get there if we just keep harping on it. A couple of things I want to uh, just talk about briefly. You mentioned that you have um, an SMRP event in September, right? That's, that's, not, that's coming up. Coming up in October. Coming up in October. And are you going to actually be at that event and giving a presentation or a workshop? Yes, I'm actually going to be at that event as a track lead, but I'm also giving a presentation on Wednesday on how your MRO taxonomy affects your uh, planning and scheduling in your organization. You know, uh, taxonomy, oh, I, I, it's, it's, it's a lesser known problem, but it affects so many people, you know, in the organization. And so we're going to deep dive into that some more. Yeah, I think people should check that out if if they get that opportunity because a lot of what you're going to talk about there is going to be so highly applicable to CMMS environments as well because it that really plays into the whole scheme of things, right? It does. Well, think about it, Greg. Even in your CMMS, if you have the ability to look up parts, what if you just typed in the word motor? How many how many motors are you going to pull up, right? If you're if you've got equipment and, and assets are not assigned to that with uh, spare parts, you know how many motors are going to pull up? But what if it was like a motor? 50 horsepower, 1750 RPM. What if you could type that in? How much quicker does that narrow that down for you? But every day we just see stuff where it just says motor or bearing, you know, or shaft, you know, so it just, it's so much time wasted for the technician, you know, for the, for the search. It's just, it's just waste. And 
we try to do a better job to help people be more efficient and eliminate that waste. But, you know, you still see it every single day, just waste. You know, we talk about industry standards of 30 to 35 percent is an average wrench time for a mechanic. So if a mechanic's mm -hmm. working 10 hours a day, they're actually saying that only for three hours of that day are they actually touching a piece of equipment. The other 60 to 65 percent is just waste, whether looking for parts, getting parts, walking to the job, you know, whatever it is. And so what if we bump that up to 45 or 50 or just saved them 5 percent of their day? How much more efficient, you know, would that organization be, you know, that and, and that right there is how you create a bona fide business opportunity right. with these best practices. And that's where the payoff is. So when people are saying, man, this is going to suck, this is going to be hard, this is going to be challenging. Damn right it is. But when you do it, man, you're going to be in such a better place because you get 10, 15% jumps in efficiencies and productivity and you dedicate more wrench time rather than less. That's money in the bank for the organization. So it really relates to top line revenue when it's all said and done. I think that's a, a critical component. A lot of it's talked about in this book right here. So um, that's that's definitely a good call out. Wanted to um, bring up one thing. It's a good time to talk about it. Reliable Plant, you mentioned it. The Reliable Plant Conference is coming up. That's hosted by Noria Corporation. It's happening in Orlando, Florida, July 31st through August 3rd. It's going to be at the Carib Royale Resort. It's the 25 year anniversary of this event, and it's going to be loaded with exceptional maintenance and reliability keynote speakers, workshops, and exhibitors. They're driving the pursuit of maintenance excellence. Of course, oil analysis and lubrication management. Uh, Nori offers a great system. It's called Lube PM that you can check out online. And it's going to be co located with the Machinery Lubrication Conference and Exhibit. So it's a really good show. I'm heading out there, and if anyone hasn't registered to attend, there's still time. Noria is offering CMMS Radio listeners a discount. You can find that at cmmsradio.com using the code GC10. So, William, what trends or, you know, specific trend are you seeing in CMMS or maintenance that are concerning that you're worried about? What I'm worried about, Greg, is uh, just in a facility this past week, we're just not getting the most out of it. It's just we're putting garbage in and we're getting garbage out. We're, we're not putting in work orders that we find on preventive maintenance. We're just going ahead and fix it. And we're not getting that extra work order to capture that data. When we're closing those work orders out, we're just putting fixed or repaired. You know, we're not putting the root cause reasons. We're not helping out our fellow techs the next time. And, you know, sometimes we're just not even assigning parts to those uh to those work orders and those CMS systems. And it's just very concerning um, the processes that are in place for people to put work orders in and properly close them out. And the excuses that these, uh, you know, people in the industry are given, you know, I didn't have time to do it. And so the planners got to, you know, put it in. Or I thought Greg did it. And so I, I thought he did it. And then somebody else did it. And then you look up and there's three or four work orders put in for the same thing. You know, so now you've got to go back in and, and close those out. And it's just a lot of wasted time. But, you know, my biggest concern I see now is just the improper utilization of their existing CMS systems a lot of times, you know, and how, how can they make that process better for what they, you know, are currently working with? You know, that's that's my concern, you know. Do you, do you find that there might be, like if I asked you, well, is there a basic, I'm going to say recipe for, or approach to – fixing that like if if you if you only had like a minute or two to tell somebody that's in that exact situation what they should do what would it be i would tell them to develop a standard have a process have a procedure exactly how that's supposed to be done how that works there's nothing wrong with sitting next to greg and going over how to put a work order in but that's the way that greg has learned to do it over the 15 years not the way that it probably supposed to be done this is the way that Greg's doing it and showing that new technician how to do it. And it's not per the procedure standard that the company has, you know, develop that procedure and that standard, you know, and, and work to that standard. You know, that's why we have repeatable work and standard work to eliminate those defects and efficiencies. So that's what I would do is just work to that standard and train them on that standard, not how somebody else thinks it should be done, but how your organization should be done so that it helps eliminate those errors. You know, a lot of times those fields are left blank for no reason, you know, make those fields. But to me, you got to have a standard in a procedure and work to that. And I think that'll help 
a lot of that if I decide to give a two minute spill on that, Greg. Yeah, I love it because it's similar to what you might expect with just about anything, right? You go buy a new car, you should you should go through the user manual a little bit, get a little familiarity there. So what I've often done when working with someone, you know, consulting for a CMMS type scenario is whatever you get, whatever you got, as you're dialing it in, because you've made this a real serious project now, document everything and create those materials that give everyone those standards that you're talking about so that that part of it, they don't have to think about. Eliminate the variability where somebody who knows exactly what they're doing is about to make their own call on, yeah, I don't need to fill that out. I don't need to fill that out. Create those standards and teach those standards and reaffirm those standards. And you know what? One last thing, reward people when they adopt those standards. Give them some accolades of some type and do some regular kind of training and make sure, hey, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Yeah, you learned it a year or two ago. But let's revisit that couple hours on a Friday afternoon that's not too disruptive to our other organizational processes. And that's very important, Greg, because, you know, there are CMS systems that have updates from time to time, and you've got to stay on those updates. It may be a new added feature that could be very beneficial for you. And if you don't, if you never find out about it, you know, you can never use it. So that's a a very important uh, comment that you made just then, you know. Absolutely. And and vendors out there, you know, you you can make a regular a regular process out of this, you know, put it into your account management department or over in customer success. And Hey, account executives and sales reps and all that. It's okay for you to check on your clients every now and then reach out to your champion and say, Hey, how's everything going? Are there any challenges there that I can convey to this department so they can reach out and help you out? What are some trends that you might be excited about that you see happening in maintenance and reliability or CMMS in general? Is there anything happening right now that you're like, yeah, this is interesting. I like where this is going. You know, Greg, and as, as far as CMMS, I, I like the fact that they're having these little portable tablets, you know, and, and uh, they're able to use those around their work site. So they're able to close out work orders. You know, it's a lot different having that handy in your hand and you can pull that work order up there and you can fill it out and you can close it out right there. I know it's got to be taken back and synced, but to me, I think it helps eliminate a lot of the reason why I didn't have time to close it out. But I've seen a lot of these uh, newer systems have these portable that you can use with an iPad or tablet or whatever, you know, as long as you've got some of the good functionality out in your plant. And it seems to be very beneficial for those. And I mean, they're resistant to grease and oil and it seems to be really good. So I'm excited about, you know, learning more about those. And the ones I've seen, though, are very, very interactive, uh, very, very good. It's almost like carrying your, you know, big laptop out there in a smaller version, you know, and getting a lot of good work done, you know. So I really like seeing yeah. that. That's great. What I've often said is you know, people say, well, our, our cowgirls and cowboys, our gunslingers that are out there turning wrenches, if you will, they tend to do some old school stuff. They'd rather have a piece of paper and all that. And, it, and I tell people, well, that's there's a simple reason why that is. They understand that and they can very quickly document what they did and they're done. They're off to the next thing. They're there. They want to do this work. They love this work. And if you have that mobile capability and you mentioned hidden in what you were saying is you mentioned offline functionality as well. That's a thing. You, you, you need that. Uh, people that are out there taking care of this stuff, they don't want to screw around with the technology. It's not that they hate it. It's that they don't want to screw around with it. That's right. They're movers and shakers and they like to get stuff done and do good work. They don't find that to be the case here. They want, okay, this, 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 boom, 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 boom. Let me document that. And three minutes later, they're off to the next thing. And uh, I'm going to take another thing that uh, John Ross shared. If it ain't documented, it didn't happen. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So they, they want to write it down. They want to be accountable. Just don't jam them up when it comes to the work they really want to do. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you is uh, how do you think, artificial intelligence fits into all of this that we've been talking about today. You know, it's funny you say that somebody asked me the other day and I, I, I told him, you know, just remember artificial intelligence was created by a human. So <laughs> we tend to forget about that. We think it's some kind of thing that's just going to overtake the world, but it was actually created by a human. So um, somebody asked me, do I see them replacing technicians? I don't know that I really receive that, Greg. I, I do see more and more robots you know, replacing some functions, you know, because I, I, I'm sure it's due to the staffing issues they've been having and things like that. I've, 
I've seen some robots that's been able to be programmed, but you still got to have somebody in the world that works on the robots, right? It, it may do the work of, of creating a weld that a human used to do, but there's still got to be that technician or that operator there, you know, that's got to work on that particular piece of equipment to keep it running. And so it's been pretty interesting doing some chat GPTs and things to see, you know, what is a work order and, and letting them write standards and stuff. It's very interesting what it's come up with, but I still find there's a lot of opportunity, you know, in that stuff too. It's just not quite perfect. And, you know, that's the media mantra seems like it's just going to replace us all in the next five years. And, you know, none of us have a job and me and you'll be sitting here letting a computer talk to each other, you know, dictating a script for us, you know? So, um, it, it's kind of like the internet of all things 4.0 it's advanced, but I don't think it's anywhere near where people would thought it would be, you know, when we started talking about this 10, 12 years ago. So I, I think we got a long way to go. I, I like some of the good things that's come out of it, but I, I I don't fear that it's going to replace us, you know, turning wrenches on machines and stuff like that. I think it can make us more efficient, but I, I don't think it's just going to replace us. Right. I really don't. I, I can't, I can't just see that because we created it. We still got to work on this stuff. We still got to manufacture it. And, and somebody's even got to work on the AI, AI piece of it, you know, when it happens to break or something, you know, indeed, indeed. I, I, I think that's really what's happening here and that it's it's really there to kind of augment and enhance what we can do from a human perspective. You're not going to eliminate the human element, at least, you know, not completely. And I think the way to look at AI is rather than being concerned, how can we make AI better so that it will understand more of what we really do? I play with chat GPT a little bit here and there, and I ask it all kinds of like CMMS and maintenance questions. And it's got a long ways to go, but I think if it's utilized properly, I think it's going to amplify and enhance the way we apply our human element, our real critical thinking, and there's ways to use it. Uh, you know, it's interesting though, to think about this idea that, oh, the machines are going to take over and we see movies about that. Yeah. Maybe someday, who knows, but uh, I don't think we have to worry about it anytime soon. I think people should be talking about that. Um, another thing I wanted to just bring up a little bit of a shout out is there's uh, a channel out there. It's called the TMCC Slack channel, the Maintenance Community Coalition. It just came back recently uh, where they had it for a while, a lot of traction there. And it's a great place for people to get in and have a lot of discussions around CMMS, maintenance and reliability. There's uh, CMRPs in there, people with this 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 real kind of insight and experience combined. And then they get collaborating and dialoguing. So I just wanted to call that out real quick for everybody. If you want to sign up and participate, doesn't matter what CMMS you use or any of that stuff. If you're involved in maintenance in any way, shape, or form, and you want to learn, you want to contribute, or both, uh, jump in there. You can go to upkeep.org slash CMMS radio to participate, contribute, and learn. So how do people get in touch with you if they want to continue the conversation or enlist your services or anything like that? We know we've got a website, which is erudicio.com, and it's E-R-U-D-I-T-I-O.com. Um, can I get my cell phone out, Greg? It's uh, 205-310-9492. Uh, w. Sloan at erudicio.com. Uh, it's, you know, I, all things storeroom, but I can help you with anything. We've got a great organization that does inspired blended learning. We do a lot of curriculums with our root cause analysis, you know, reliable engineers, maintenance managers. Um, we've got a storeroom class coming up in November. I mean, I'm sorry, in September that we'd love to have people, you know, sign up for, but you know, hit me up on LinkedIn. You know, everybody seems to be LinkedIn seems to be the best place to collaborate and get in touch with folks. So just send me a message. I'll be more than happy to respond. Um, but you know, I'll travel all over the country and I'll just try to help anywhere I can, Greg, because that's what we're all here to do is, is just to help, help others. You know, that's why we're in this business. And you talked about CMRP is just being a net contributor. You know, our goal is to help help people get better. And we don't necessarily tell people they're doing something wrong, but it, we just always look for ways to improve and help people. And you want to be sincere and genuine when you do that, right? Um, we're not trying to sell things. You know, we're just trying to help everybody in this maintenance reliability industry, you know, get better and be better. And so that we, you know, make this world a better place for for the products and stuff that we're trying to, you know, produce for our for our customers, you know, so... Love it. Couldn't have said it better myself and really trying to make progress, trying to solve problems, yeah. trying to get things done better and better without losing the quality of the work that we all want to do. I don't care who you are. You want to do good stuff. So 
William, I really appreciate you making the time today. It was great to have you. And I will drop that information on the episode, on the video version, so that people can see how they can get in touch with you. And with that, I hope you continue to do the great things you're doing for the maintenance community. And I really appreciate your time today and offering all of your insights for the CMMS radio community. Greg, I appreciate you taking the time to have this platform and talk about all things CMMS and other things to, you know, benefit the community as well. It's a great service that you're doing for, for us. I really appreciate that as well. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it until next time. All right. Hey, take care. Did you find this episode helpful? Please send us some feedback, suggest a topic or ask a question. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project. Visit CMMSRadio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.